Well, South Africa is part of the BRICS and presents African countries with opportunities to enhance trade, industry and economic growth. One area where BRICS can assist Africa is in agriculture. Although the sector employs the majority of Africans, the sector has severely underperformed over the past decade. Joining me in studio, Omri Fanzel, leader of Deloitte Africa Agribusiness Unit. He's here to elaborate on how BRICS grouping can contribute to Africa's agricultural development. Thanks for joining us, Omri. Thank you. So you've got some ideas about agricultural hubs and, of course, the models, business model that really needs to be used to commercialize African agriculture. But let's just talk about the nature of BRICS investment in the agricultural space on the continent right now. How would you characterize it? It's very interesting if you look at the statistics, uh, BRICS is 40% invested in the developed world and only 2.5% in each other. So there's a big opportunity for BRICS countries to come actually come into Africa and develop agricultural opportunities uh, around the continent and basically export these back to their own domestic markets. Mm -hmm. So we know that India is invested to a degree in the agricultural space in Africa right now. How's that investment characterized and uh, given the fact of course that they've done really well in boosting their commercial agricultural sector, given the fact that they've got a similar story to Africa with small scale farmers? I think the Indians are seeing a lot of potential in Africa. I know they've got 30 projects that are currently running where they're developing intellectual property and they're developing being um, technology to actually uh, you know spread that across the continent the, th the thing about India is there's a lot of synergy in terms of the language for example in sub-saharan especially in the in the anglophone countries so um, and, and they're seeing the opportunities to actually refine their own model of smallholder farmers mm -hmm. and bring that to the continent where they can actually explore that further so are we going to see more of that, more of Indian investors coming into the continent or are there barriers to entry that need to be considered? I think we're on the brink of a wave now where everybody's looking at the continent and starting to make their moves. A lot of my clients are asking me where to go to. I think um, my advice uh, you know, to my clients and, and across the board would be looking at the countries where the barriers of entry are the lowest, with the lowest political risk, where the security of tenure, of land tenure, is not a big issue and where there's a commercial uh, local market to actually take up the goods that are produced on the farms and through the agribusinesses. You need that support infrastructure around uh, the farms. You need to be able to get the goods to the market. Um, so where would those potentially attractive countries be? Well, the attractive countries currently, Zambia is probably one of the prime examples that have opened their gates to agriculture and the companies that are there are doing really well. Considered, I mean, pretty much Africa's new breadbasket. Exactly. Um, it's got a lot of the old skills from Zimbabwe that has moved up there. A lot of they're doing really well in starches um, and in grains. So I, I think that's, that's a very good example. Then you get Tanzania that's, that's waking up. You get Botswana that's also making some moves. Um, Namibia is a well entrenched economy, uh, agro economy. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities that are actually, I know, for example, the Ministry of, of Agriculture in Nigeria are starting to aggressively move in that space because mm -hmm. they can see that the local consumer market cries out for, for cheaper products. And, and, you know, that is something that West Africa is, of course, the, the biggest potential market in Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, the one of the comments that come out of uh, the agricultural investment uh, space right now is that China is looking to, to buy up land here to feed the masses back home. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you buy into that theory? It depends on what you're talking about. If you're looking at grain and, for example, meats, there is a possibility of that. I think China's first prerogative is to feed their own local initiatives around mining and infrastructure development. And you're talking about resources feeding them? Uh, yes. Yeah. And, then, um, and then, you know, further down the line, if, if that country cannot sustain itself from a, a population growth, you know, must remember that India is growing faster than China on a population growth perspective, mm -hmm. then that is a potential market. But one thing I realized in the BRICS conference is we must not underestimate the opportunities for us in those markets because those markets are absolutely massive and there's a lot of opportunities that can, we can actually take back to them. Yeah, so you're talking about South Africa here or you're talking about Africa? <laughs> I'm talking about Africa. Yeah. Mm. When it comes to, to India, it's interesting that you mentioned that, uh, the fact that you know, they've got a great incentive basically to be investing in agriculture right now. Um, so, so are we going to start seeing uh, greater investment uh, really in the primary agricultural space as opposed to IP and technology R&D where they are already invested in Africa? That's an interesting question because I think a lot of people want to invest in further downstream 
but the reality is currently in Africa we don't have the primary infrastructure or the primary agriculture base to actually facilitate the downstream investments or the downstream processing of these products. So I think we would all have to begin there because mm -hmm. that's the source and that source obviously carries more risk. So the question would be how do you, how do you cover your risk, how do you make sure that you buff it against all the different fluctuations in agriculture. Mm -hmm. You know, your model, uh, of course, is, is looking at how to commercialize agriculture. So just firstly take us through the role that the private sector and government needs to play in these agricultural hubs. Well, firstly, I think government needs to open, open the gates. They need to actually change the, percep the perceptions that the outside world has of Africa and the specific countries because people, investors tend to lump Africa together and say in Africa this is the story whereas these different countries are different in themselves. Uh, once that's been done, actually create, facilitate opportunities to say here is a piece of land that you can come and farm on, here are the benefits, these are the tax breaks, these are, this is how we will help you facilitate it, this is the market, you know, basically this play that This is us building role. a road. To yeah. get to the port. Yeah. Here's a road that links the, the value chain. You know, we can take this to the port, to, to your example, and basically take that and, and, and put it to the outside world. Because I can tell you now, the Chinese, the, even the Brazilians, uh, uh, the Indians are really hungry for investment opportunities, for mm -hmm. fresh investment opportunities. And, and Africa probably poses the biggest opportunity globally to actually do that, especially in agriculture. Now we know there's arable land, I mean 600 mm. million hectares of it in Africa right now. So if mm. the governments aren't going to move fast enough to create this uh, one we call enabling environment, mm. can the private sector step in, build the roads, and buy the land anyway and get on it uh, without government support? You see there's a very interesting, if you for example link the mining and resources industry to what's happening in agriculture, if you make that link and you l look at, the, for example, the Bayra Corridor development or what's happening in the northern parts of Mozambique is, is like really substantial. If you can link all those things together, you can definitely get private sectors moving into agriculture opportunities without having government spending lots of money. But agriculture itself doesn't justify massive capital uh, expenditure to build roads or railway infrastructure mm -hmm. or anything like that. But that can be done on the back of mining. Yeah, so it's the leveraging of other infrastructure that is just being built yes. around uh, growing economies. Let's go back to, to BRICS uh, because we talked about India, we talked about China. What about Brazil? Because Brazil really has this agricultural miracle. Um, it started with, I think in 1973, you've got the, the Agricultural Research Corporation, Embrapa, mm. um, and they've been really a catalyst to be creating kind of the enabling environment. They went to Africa, they brought back grass. Mm. Uh, they've, I think they brought back um, uh, cattle from India but basically mm. they've created this agricultural miracle in Brazil what, what can mm. Africa take from that you see there's a couple of, of, of things I think the first is Brazil is one country it's, it's a massive country so you can get scale in farming there uh, that you can't get necessarily in separate parts of Africa on little smaller parcels so I think that's the first thing. It is definitely an agriculture success story. The research and development in that country and how they've actually brought that to the smaller guys have really made a big difference to that country's economy. Give us an example. And, 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 and for example, um, the, the one guy on the panel was an expert in, in, in mapping farms. So you would have like a little drone plane that would fly over. So if you're a small older farmer, you want to know what you can plant where. He would unleash that little drone plane that would fly over his farm. He could map that farm, see specifically where are the topographical uh, you know, opportunities, what is the, la the soil types, where is the water, and they could basically formulate a little plan for that farmer around that thing. So and we need to find this Brazilian <laughs> guy with his plane, bring him to Africa and let his planes fly yeah, over small he scale like farm a, land. He looked like a bit of a dangerous guy, but yes, we definitely need to get that. Um, and, and a lot of that would be funded by government. So government would say, come in, design a little plan for this guy that, that works, and then take it from there. The other comment I want to make about Brazil, it's, it's very language centric. So even at the BRICS conference, I mean, you saw that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, so, so Brazil is currently focusing heavily on, 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 on Angola, so probably, and uh, Mozambique. Which are they investing in agriculture in these countries though? They, they are not that invested in agriculture, but they're definitely starting to. Mm -hmm. um, and these are two of the fastest growing economies in Africa as well. So that's their primary focus for now. Um, I think a lot of what they've done, we can extrapolate and basically take that to some of the other countries. But I think the language barrier is the first you know, barrier to entry on the continent. Mm -hmm.